The obvious predecessor of any book like this is Edmund Goss's Father and Son, which many of the reviews duly mentioned. But what people tend not to mention is that that was the second of Goss's books about his father, and he'd written a reverent, neutral, public biography of him first. So although the book set, at the time, a new standard, well, it virtually invented the idea that the family was a psychological space and that what happened inside the family was very different or might be very different from how the family looked from outside. But I think I was attracted by the idea of doing both those volumes at the same time to do a, a quite a lot about my father's life freestandingly in ways that had nothing to do with me, but not to fall in the trap, which lots of people get in the trap of, like Isherwood writing about his parents, of thinking that every detail is automatically interesting. But I find it interesting how alien the law is, for instance, that this world which was the atmosphere both my parents breathed, because they were both liars, was so, might as well be methane to my lungs because I, I cannot get nourishment from it. And to look at some detail, because the fiction in the family was, dad wanted all his sons to be lawyers, therefore somehow they naturally had legal brains. Well, mine just isn't. And the way the law is constituted, both as a rhetorical display and a sort of exercise in practical philosophy where the distinctions between categories may make the difference between somebody being free and unfree, and in the past, between their being alive or dead. That seemed worth investigating. But again, I always highlight my bafflement. You know, what are these people talking about? How is a contract void because unperformable or voidable because void? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it might as well be Gertrude Stein talking. I think it goes with the territory that you have nothing to corroborate your memory with by and large. I mean, I have a couple of brothers, so I could ask them questions about that, about, about certain things, but things that happened to me and not to them, I can't. But then that it does go with the territory. What's relatively unusual is to undermine your own authority as you go along, because ever since Truman Capote claimed to have written in cold blood using some sort of trained photographic memory skill that he could absolutely replay people's conversations word for word. That is the convention of memoir that you're remembering everything. And every now and then I flag up the fact that this is, if it was on TV, it would say reconstruction in large letters at the bottom. But again, I try to create a sense of play by being aware that if you've had a dominant uh, parent and you've had to think and feel your way away from that influence and are then looking back on them, you're likely to diminish them. You're likely to make them ridiculous. And so it became important to me, as I can't stop that, I mean, it's part of the refraction that is necessary to the endeavour. What I could choose to do was to destroy my own dignity. So there are points where I tell the most ludicrously embarrassing things about myself. I hope not out of exhibitionism because I, I don't think that's it's not a style to take people's breath away with the candor of my self-confrontation, but to come up with deeply embarrassing things, embarrassing things that I don't need to tell you about. Because dad, your father, is the person you write about as a biographer is helpless on the page. And all you can do is level the playing ground a bit by making yourself look as amply ridiculous as everybody else knows you to be. He was intensely homophobic and that was entirely sincere. It wasn't a pose, it was a visceral horror for him. And he would not have understood those contemporaries of his, I mean in the 1950s and 60s when he was making his way as a lawyer, if there were other people who said, well, you know, everybody knows the law's an ass, but if these fools, you know, if these charming young people who are so good at, at crimping and makeup uh, happen to get themselves arrested, well, it's their own silly fault, isn't it? But they, they, you know, they seem lovely butterflies and they seem to have a splendid time. Um, I just, uh, just don't want them to sit anywhere near me. My father would have been horrified because to him, homosexuality was an absolute wrong and uh, not to be treated with worldly banter. And it's not quite that I admire him for that, but at the same time, hypocrisy was not his stock in trade. And if something was illegal, then to him it was obvious it was because it was bloody wrong. It's certainly the case that being a judge and being a literary critic have some sort of relationship with each other. When I was writing early uh, reviews, there was one review of mine I was particularly pleased of. It was a review of the first, uh, I think it's called the Rambo, the first Rambo film, not the one not the first one in the series, but is it called First Blood or is that the first one? Anyway, the one where ludicrously 
Sylvester Sloan goes wild in some foreign country and shoots a thousand people. And I was really pleased with my review and showed it to my father, which was probably silly because it wasn't his world. And he said, not bad, too many, uh, too many uh, parentheses. You block the flow of the argument too much. And he was right. My victims aren't shut away. Uh, I imagine I have a negligible effect on sales. If you were able to, do, to come up with some algorithm which was able to separate out the impact on sales of every review, I would be very surprised if I made the slightest bit of difference. And sometimes I write a bad review that nevertheless makes a book sounds interesting. The ones I try to avoid writing are the good reviews that make a book sound dull. <laughs> Because I suppose because I feel I've suffered from them. As a, as a writer, I feel my mistake has been to write exciting books that sound dull. That Pilcrow and Sedilla sound deadly dull. Noriko Smiling sounds deadly dull. If you describe those books to me, I wouldn't want to read them myself. And the same is true of books like Ulysses and Proust, that when you first hear what they're about, you think, why would anybody want to spend time writing that? Why would anybody spend time reading that? You need to have a certain amount of momentum or cultural clout before people start taking you seriously. And I feel that the number of books of mine that have been reviewed favorably in a way that made me bored of the books that were being talked about, uh, I do determine that you will never read a neutrally warm review of mine because I don't think you've read the book if that's your final conclusion.